Hello everyone and welcome to County Perspective. This show focuses on Frederick County government, local programs and events, and the Frederick County community. I'm your host Brandon Rosa and thank you for joining us. Now like we do at the beginning of the show, let's take a look at our top news stories. County Executive Jessica Fitzwater held a public information briefing on Thursday, March 9th to announce preliminary information about her proposed fiscal year 2024 budget. She announced several capital projects that will be included in her budget and invited residents to review the full list of new funding requests online at frederickcountymd.gov budget. Members of the public are invited to speak to their budget priorities for the coming fiscal year at the county executive's upcoming public hearing. The public hearing is scheduled for 7 p.m. on Tuesday, March 14th. The event will take place at Winchester Hall with a call-in option available for those who cannot attend in person. People can also take an interactive online survey about their budget priorities. Let's hear more about how the survey works. Frederick County is a vibrant and growing community. We have a vision, a Frederick County where all people can live, work, and thrive while feeling a strong sense of place and belonging. Frederick County Executive Jessica Fitzwater and the Frederick County Budget Office know that an open, transparent, and thoughtful budget process is essential to making this vision a reality. That's why we need you to share your input on the county's budget priorities. We are pleased to share Balancing Act, an interactive tool that gives you the opportunity to prioritize items for funding from the many requests that have been received by the county executive this year. In the budget simulation, you will see the total funding to allocate to your budget priorities. The spending categories are on the right-hand side of the screen. Click the arrow next to each spending category to view your funding options. The cost of each item is shown at the end of each description. You can click on the blue information icons to see additional detail about that request. As you make your selections, you will see the remaining funds at the top of your screen. Once you have finished, click Submit and answer the exit questions. This interactive tool can be accessed on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. To access the program and provide your input, just go to the Budget Office website and click Budget Survey. We value your input and look forward to hearing from you. People living in Brunswick, Emmitsburg, Jefferson, and Thurmont will soon have more access to transit's award-winning services, including round-trip shuttles and Saturdays, thanks to a pilot program that launches Saturday, April 1st. County Executive Jessica Fitzwater, joined by the mayors of Brunswick, Emmitsburg, and Thurmont, announced the expansion of transit routes. We've done extensive outreach in the Brunswick, Emmitsburg, Thurmont, and Jefferson communities to listen directly to riders and those who don't or can't currently ride about how we can improve transit. So you all spoke and we listened. We heard that access to medical appointments, social events, and shopping at different times and in different ways were really things that are needed by our community. This shuttle's expansion is only possible due to the efforts of Mayors Briggs, Brown, and Kennard, as they allowed us to join with them at community outreach events, share the message about transit services, and solicit public feedback. We're very appreciative that riders and non-riders alike came out to share their information and thoughts with transit services. To learn more about transit services and the new routes, visit frederickcountymd.gov transit. Maryland Governor Wes Moore came to Frederick County on Friday, March 3rd to tour Frederick Community College's newly renovated health science facility and other sites across the county. Frederick County Executive Jessica Fitzwater gave a brief presentation to Governor Moore, Lieutenant Governor Aruna Miller, members of their cabinet, and local officials. Officials then visited several other sites including Root, the Health Department, Maryland School for the Deaf, Platoon 22, apartments at 520 North Market Street, and the Prospect Center, which is being renovated into county offices. The governor plans to hold meetings in different regions of the state each month with his cabinet as part of his cabinet meeting road tour. Recently, FCG TV released its new series called Farming Frederick that gives viewers an up-close look at farming in our county. The first episode in the series was about how local farmers gather milk from dairy cows with modern equipment. Now, in the latest episode, FCG TV visited district farms to learn about how lettuce is grown with hydroponics. 
I'm Yvette Castillo, and I've never been on a farm before. I'm visiting farms across Frederick County, Maryland to learn about local farming. You're watching Farming Frederick. As of 2022, the United States has 2,370 hydroponic crop farming businesses. Right here in Frederick County, there are only two. One hydroponic farm that grows sprouts and one that grows a variety of lettuce. 90% of the leafy greens consumed in the United States are grown in California and Arizona. So it is important that Frederick County has leafy greens right here in our backyard for freshness. I'm standing in one of the greenhouses at District Farms located off Bassford Road. I'm about to meet co-owner Ollie to learn how they grow lettuce with hydroponics. Hi Ollie, this is quite a sight. All I see is green lettuce, it's everywhere. So what is a hydroponic farm? Well, uh, a hydroponic farm such as ours, at least on a commercial scale, uh, is one that uh, can reuse pretty much all the water that gets pumped out to the plants um, and a closed loop system. And uh, very often, hydroponically grown leafy greens or frankly any uh, fruit or vegetable is grown indoors in a climate controlled environment. Okay, and how many types of uh, lettuce do you grow here? Well, we grow many different types. I've actually lost count at this point, um, okay. but many of the types that we grow, uh, uh, at least the varying colors, the ones that are, uh, uh, are red and green and different types of those, we cut those and we package that as spring mix. And then another staple product that we grow is our butter lettuce, okay. um, which is packed actually as living. So the root ball remains intact in a clamshell, uh, so it can retain its freshness. So I've never been to a hydroponic farm before. What is the process? How do you grow the lettuce from start to finish? Sure. How do you do it? Right here, we're in our uh, uh, young plants area. So after we seed and we uh, let the plants germinate for a little bit, we bring them out here um, for a couple weeks or a few weeks, depending on the season. They grow on these tables uh, in the trays. And then after that, we actually take them and we transplant them into our uh, kind of our, what we call our growing troughs. Um, and that's where they get the size, um, the, the long um, leaves, the nice vibrant colors. It takes a few weeks or a little longer on that and then we'll, we'll take them off and uh, we'll harvest them accordingly. And how many would you say that you grow? I mean, this, this greenhouse is huge. It looks like the size of a football field. Sure, sure. How many do you grow in this space? Well, I, so uh, I think we calculated at a minimum, uh, I think we're slated to grow at least 5 million heads this year just this year alone. Um, but it's probably gonna be more than that um, based on just the uh, favorable growing conditions, okay. uh, late spring and into early uh, fall. Okay. And then it feel, it's cold outside, but it feels very comfortable in here. Is there has to be a certain temperature for the greenhouse to- Yeah, okay. yeah. We do control the climate um, as best as we can. In the winter, we'd like it to be warm. And then obviously vice versa in summer. Uh, so um, to create the optimal conditions for our lettuce to grow. So it looks really clean in here and the lettuce looks clean. Is that one of the advantages of growing in a greenhouse? Yes, yes. We get to shield our lettuce uh, from animals, uh, bugs, and the weather. Okay. And once you package everything up, do you ship the lettuce anywhere? Yeah, so we uh, primarily ship out to um, the Baltimore Jessup area, the Philly market, and all the way up to New York currently. Oh, wow. That's yeah, but great. we're looking to expand it as elsewhere as well. Great. That's great. Well, thank you for having me at your farm today and sharing what you do here at District Farms. Thank you. Now, we all know how leafy greens are grown on a hydroponic farm right here in Frederick County. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to eat a salad. If you would like to know more about District Farms or any other farm in Frederick County, visit homegrownfrederick.com. Okay, everyone, it's time for a short break, but in just a few more minutes, we'll be back with more on County Perspective.
Welcome back to County Perspective. I'm your host, Brandon Rosa. Now, before we take a look at the newest episode of Destination Frederick County, we're going to head over to Animal Control to see who this episode's Pet of the Week is. Woodstock is FCAC's one-year-old cattle dog mix, and while he's the king of cuddles outside the kennel, on the adoption floor, he doesn't always show very well. When visitors walk by, they don't see the smiley, playful Woodstock, but a stressed version. Woodstock is fun-loving, treat-motivated, and full of energy. Don't let his kennel behavior keep you from finding your next furry family member. Be sure to ask the staff to meet Woodstock outside. To learn more about Woodstock and our adoption process, call Frederick County Animal Control and Pet Adoption Center at 301-600-1546. Are you looking for new ideas for a day trip? Well, check out Destination Frederick County. In our latest adventure, FCG TV traveled to Monocacy Battlefield to learn more about black history during the Civil War. Let's take a look. Located three miles south of Frederick City, Monocacy National Battlefield preserves more than 1,600 acres of land on the north and south shores of the Monocacy River. On July 9, 1864, a crucial battle in the American Civil War took place on this ground, where forces of the United States Army successfully delayed Confederate forces attempting to attack the nation's capital at Washington, D.C. The Battle of Monocacy quickly became known as the battle that saved Washington, but far more than just a battle took place on this hallowed ground. Come along as we learn more about the black history of Monocacy National Battlefield. The land preserved by the National Park Service at Monocacy National Battlefield includes the site of an enslaved labor farm from the early years of the United States. Through intense historical research and archaeology, rangers are sharing stories of those enslaved on properties now included in the National Park. The Hermitage uh, was the property that we're on today uh, that we refer to as the best farm and originally it was uh, owned by uh, a woman named Victoire de la Vincendière, her, parent, uh, her family had escaped both from the French Revolution and the slave rebellions in Saint-Domingue and purchased this property. They seem to be sort of recreating this sort of plantation um, that they would have known uh, in Saint-Domingue where they were from, which was a coffee plantation uh, with a, a large amount of enslaved people um, on their property. She was the second largest um, slave owner in Frederick County at the time. We certainly recognize that the Civil War, you know, the root cause of the Civil War is slavery. The economics, the politics, uh, the injustice, all of that that kind of rolls into it. And this is a location where you have this dichotomy of French immigrants who are coming in seeking freedom yet they are holding enslaved people on their property as well. In September 1862, Abraham Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation, announcing that all enslaved people in rebellious states would be free as of January 1st, 1863. Recruitment of African American regiments began following the proclamation's adoption. The United States Colored Troops were an organization developed during the American Civil War for African American men to fight for the Union cause. The organization is actually made up of a variety of folks from within the African American community. We have free people of color, we have the contrabands or folks that are literally fleeing from the South and of course the recently emancipated or self-emancipated folks who have freed themselves in the years leading up to the Civil War and immediately there or I should say during. There was a recruiting center here at Monocacy Junction. Now Frederick County is going to have approximately 500 African American men enlist in the Union War effort and be shipped out from Monocacy Junction. While there was very unlikely an actual desk with someone behind it to sign all these guys in and get their paperwork squared away at the junction, what had happened was is recruiters have actually gone out through Frederick County to the various churches, to people's homes, and enlisted those men where they're from. They would then come to Monocacy Junction, or Frederick Junction as it was also known, and they from there would ship out to places like Baltimore and elsewhere, many of these men joining even some of the most famous regiments of the United States Colored Troops. 
When thinking of battlefield landscapes, the conflict itself is often what comes to mind. Monocacy National Battlefield's Tenant House covers far more than combat and fighting. The Tenant House Museum is going to be open this spring. It's a seasonal part of the battlefield. And it has a variety of stories in there related to the civilians that were on this landscape long before July 9, 1864 and the Battle of Monocacy and long after. In the 20th century, African-American migrant workers came to Frederick County from areas of the South. Researchers at Monocacy National Battlefield have begun to explore their place in the region's long history. So we do understand that the migrant workers that were here were whole families. Uh, they would work here uh, from the springtime towards uh, early fall until October. Uh, they would work on the land, they would harvest, and afterwards they would also work in downtown Frederick at the canneries. So we know that the migrant workers, it was whole families that were here. Uh, we have a swing set that we've identified recently due to um, recent research. Uh, we also know of graffiti that were very, were very, it's likely it was produced by the migrant workers. And we also know uh, within the landscape itself, we have what we are considering archeological sites with uh, the remains of products uh, along hedgerows. For me, the most important legacy of African American history here at Monocacy National Battlefield is really the spirit of resistance that we see in the enslaved populations that were here. Each one of our farms here at Monocacy had enslaved labor, and yet we have documentation of self-emancipation or escaping, actually resisting slavery. And of course, furthering that, we have the United States Colored Troops themselves recruiting near and around this region, shipping out from Monocacy Junction and going to fight for the freedom of their people in the American Civil War. It is that time in the show where we look at this episode's calendar of events to find out what our county divisions are offering in the next few weeks to keep you and your family and friends busy. Now that the weather is warming up, there's plenty to do. Let's take a look. If you'd like to find out more about virtual events and programs and activities that are going on in the county, visit frederickcountymd.gov. Before I have to say goodbye, I want to tell you about some good news. On March 2nd, County Executive Jessica Fitzwater hosted a press conference to announce that Frederick County businesses that are associated with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or better known as STEM, now have the opportunity to grow their talented workforce with the 10-week-long internship program. The program is provided by Discover Frederick and is designed to broaden the pool of candidates while exposing interns to experiences unique to Frederick County. The internship program will recruit up to 30 students from targeted colleges and universities across Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. The program starts on June 3rd and ends on August 12th. The last day for businesses to apply is April 28th. Businesses interested in the housing program should apply by March 31st. For more information, visit frederickcountymd.gov slash STEM interns or call workforce development strategist Mariel Fetty at 301-600-2754 or mfetty at frederickcountymd.gov. Come to Rose Hill Manor to experience the new Crossroads Change in Rural America exhibit provided by the Smithsonian Institution. The exhibit will be available from now until April 14th with viewing hours starting from 11 a.m. and ending at 4 p.m. This exhibit will teach visitors the importance of Frederick County's crossroads from its use as a place through which nomadic indigenous peoples traveled to its role as a pre-revolution gatekeeper to the West to the first tourists arriving on motor cars and 
the early 1900s to travelers on the CNO Canal and more. The exhibit will also showcase the importance of rural communities. To find out more, visit recreator.com slash crossroads. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is all the time we have left for this episode of County Perspective. Now, if you want to stay up to date on important news and events going on in the county, follow Frederick County on social media. We'll see you next time with a fresh look from County Perspective. Take care, everybody. Thank you.